say good afternoon and welcome to our, I think it is our first official GIAS activity in, in NTU. My name is Kristen, for those of you who don't know me, and I'm a research director in the President's Office. And that means that I help to coordinate research activities within NTU and also with other partners outside NTU. Uh, one of my other roles is to coordinate the Global Dialogue Group, which is a group of uh, different units that have come together to give a more integrated, coordinated uh, approach to some of the uh, university level conferences and seminars and workshops that we hold through NTU. And that's my connection with, with GIAS. So I'm one of the main points of contact for GIAS uh, in NTU. I will get around to introducing Peter and Zachary at a later point, and I'm kind of glad that we are a smaller group because it gives us a bit of a chance to get to know each other as well, because sometimes it takes an event like this for us to be able to meet people that we wouldn't normally interact with in NTU, or often at times it will happen outside of NTU, we meet people that, uh, that we pass by every day but might not get to uh, interact with too much. So without any further ado, what we're going to do today is give you a general introduction to GIAS and its activities, uh, hear from Zachary Walker about his experience and maybe Susie as well, if she has the energy to do it. We'll have a short break and then have a little bit more of a discussion about the future projects, what we can do together. Uh, do we need to have any follow-up meetings with either the people that are here today or if there's other contacts that you have in NTU who you think would be interested in being involved, then we can, we can connect with those people as well. And then uh, we'll have a well-earned uh, buffet dinner outside uh, uh, when we're finished with our rigorous program here. So first of all, uh, the question may be on your, your mind of what is GIAS or what is the Johannesburg Institute for Advanced Study. So this was a, uh, a, a unit that was an initiative from NTU and the University of Johannesburg. And in brief, the purpose of the, of the institute is to promote advanced research in humanities and the natural sciences. So it's very broad in its scope, uh, but also uh, looking beyond our normal regular teaching and research activities. So it might be a bit of a stretch of our imaginations and requires a little bit more creativity to come up with some you know, worthwhile programs that will help us to develop uh, programs, workshops, collaborations beyond our normal uh, research and teaching duties. Uh, the key words that I've outlined here, and this is all on the GIS website as well, are that we, we, I mean, we GIS, am I, am I part of GIS, can I say we? Uh, that the institute aims to be, yes, yeah, very collaborative and also focused on uh, scholarly uh, initiatives. And of course, I can't move on without mentioning the wonderful physical building itself. So the institute is located in Johannesburg, and Peter will tell you a little bit more about this. It's uh, on a site with uh, residential workshop and conference facilities and a nice swimming pool there as well. <laughs> Does anybody actually ever go in the swimming yeah. pool? Mm, okay, okay, good, good. And so this was obviously... Your bring your trunks. <laughs> the, the GIS was conceived, I guess, by uh, over a period of time, mainly by these two young chaps shown here, who you may recognise, the first being Bertil Anderson, who's the president of NTU, and the second being Iron Rensberg, who is the vice chancellor of the University of Johannesburg. So over time, these, these two individuals met at different times in different places around the world and decided that it would be uh, uh, beneficial to both institutions, both NTU and UJ, to come together and do something together. They weren't quite clear in the first instance what that something would be. But over time, the concept of an Institute for Advanced Study uh, came out of their discussions. So this would have probably been, I guess, around 2013, 2014. Uh, and then in May 2015, the first uh, agreement was signed to launch the, to launch the, the Institute. 
it's gone from strength to strength and Peter will give you some background of the past programs and the things that are coming up on the, the academic and intellectual side, which he's much better at doing than, than I am. But I just wanted to mention as well that in earlier this year in March, we did have a, a, an agreement and then a signing to extend the relationship uh, to have GIAS as the major initiative between NTU and UJ. So this extension was signed to uh, extend, the, <coughs> extend the, the longevity for at least another five years. Uh, so we're here, we're here to stay at least for the next five years. And so we really are interested in developing great programs and activities that will help to uh, benefit both sides, the, not just the institutions, but the individuals within those institutions. This is a picture of, uh, that we took at the signing ceremony in March. So we have Peter, myself, and Bertul, and Iron, of course. And then we have the, uh, the Singapore High Commissioner to South Africa, who graced the event. Uh, Wei Ching, who is a writing fellow at Johannesburg at the moment. So she's a NIE PhD student. And Prof Chidzili Mawala, who's the Deputy Vice Chancellor of UJ and also a great supporter of the Institute. To give you an idea of the, maybe the similarities or some complementarity between NTU and UJ, NTU is a little bit older. <coughs> UJ was formed about 11 years ago through the, uh, uh, the merger, the merger of four different campuses to come together to create uh, UJ. Uh, it's also slightly bigger. It's not often that we encounter universities that are larger than NTU, but maybe that was the, one of the challenges that we we're interested in doing. And I've just shown here the, the similarities between our missions uh, and visions. So not only are we bringing NTU and UJ together, we're bringing Singapore and South Africa together and also potentially Asia and Africa. It's a big ask, but uh, who says that we're not up for, for the challenge? Uh, and again, a little bit more information about UJ, uh, possibly more comprehensive than NTU in terms of the, the faculty. So as you know, NTU is, doesn't have a faculty of law. We don't have architecture. Um, we do, of course, have a strong engineering uh, and some of the other areas as well. So there is some similarities. Our role, NTU's role in GIS is, is quite clear in the agreements that have been signed, but it also allows for us to have a little bit of input in how we can interpret as well. So I guess the most important thing for us here today is that what NTU has committed to and is continuing to, to support is to identify and support scholars, which is, which is all of you here, to participate uh, in the work and the deliberations of the Institute, and also to provide some support and advice uh, for the development of programs. We also uh, participate in the, in the governance structure. So even though it's based in Johannesburg, NTU is very committed to uh, supporting, uh, uh, providing uh, different types of resources for the work in, in Johannesburg. And it's something that uh, we want to provide people with the opportunity to be involved with. In There's a couple of people here who have been over and had the experience in, in GIS. Um, and when you talk to them and hear from them, then you'll realize that there is a lot, um, there's a lot of ways and there's a lot of scope that we can interact and be involved in through NTU. So just to recap, I'm going to just finish up quite soon with my welcome remarks. I'll hand over to Peter shortly. Zachary will share a little bit. We'll have a break and then uh, perhaps a little bit more of a discussion and then a dinner. Uh, I know it's always very <laughs> intimidating, or maybe not intimidating, very wearisome when it's at the end of the day and we talk about having a group discussion and being proactive and everybody interacting. But the, the purpose is really to get some feedback from, from you guys, from NTU, uh, to help us to create connections and, and, and be creative in the types of programming that, we, that we're going to um, put forward for the next one, two, three, four, five years and beyond. Feedback from everybody is, is welcome, students, staff and faculty. And like I said, if you know other people that would be interested to be involved, then please you know, leave their contact details with us today as well because we need to make sure everybody has the opportunity to, to be involved. So that's all I'm going to say for now.
I would like to hand over to Peter Vale, who is our, <laughs> I won't say that many words, who is our director of the Johannesburg Institute for Advanced Study and for this month is a visiting professor in NTU, which is part of NTU's commitment to the, to the GIAS. So, yes, without any further ado. So thank you very much, uh, Kirsten. And I also want to thank Kirsten uh, uh, and her group, Christian and her group, uh, and uh, her staff who are just fantastically supporting this project. Uh, and uh, we've come enorm we made enormous strides uh, since, uh, since, that, um, since she was appointed to be the point person. So this is what uh, I'll be talking about. Um, this we've already touched on. Oh, of course I can't do it properly. That's good. Uh, so we've already touched when this happened. I mean, just to reinforce something that uh, Christian said, I don't think these guys had an idea in their head of what this should be. I mean, I always tell the story. I think they looked at each other over a pool, uh, each having had a glass of wine or a glass of whiskey and said, this would be a fantastic idea. Let's do something. And then gradually this idea of an institute for advanced study came into fruition. Um, but I think it is an interesting uh, partnership with a lot of possibilities. And if we're going to, my view on these things is if, you know, if academics are going to get together, they must use the possibilities as much as they can and try and get as much out of it as possible. So what we have tried to do is uh, work on this thing here, build a strong reputation across universities, cities, countries, and continents. This is the marriage certificate that's on a wall uh, at Gias. It's uh, problematic because it's rusting on the one side. <laughs> So we've got to burnish it a little bit, otherwise the marriage certificate uh, and the partnership will go uh, uh, turn to rust and I don't want that to happen. I just want to spend a short little time talking about this slide because this slide I think is a good idea of talking about forms of institutes for advanced study and says why this one is such a unique one. Most uh, institutes for advanced study, if you leave Oxford and the College de France out of it, most of them uh, come on the Princeton model, so they're freestanding from the university, stand separate from the university. Some others, like the one at La Trobe in Australia, which is a past tense institute for advanced study, uh, is closely linked to the university. In other words, it's integral to a part of the university. There's a very good institute for advanced study in the uh, University of British Columbia, which they call an institute for advanced study, but it's a home essentially for people who want to do sabbaticals. So they go from there and spend some time in the institute for advanced study. And then there's some institutes for advanced study which are actually integrated in departments uh, maybe 20 years ago, I spent three months at NYU in an institute for advanced study which was integrated into the history department, which is a fantastic place full of Marxists and a few other reprobates. Uh, and unsurprisingly, the new president closed it. Um, and then I think that what we have in Gias is something quite special because it's a trans-university and transcontinental institute, and it's different. And so it's an interesting experiment in this context. Uh, I was talking earlier today to Balash, uh, who said he was going to come, um, because uh, there was this freestanding institute for advanced study in Budapest, uh, which eventually ran out of European money and has now moved to another city. So they go through different f uh, uh, phases in their lives. This is not the first Institute for Advanced Study in Johannesburg. There is another one in a city called Stellenbosch, which is very much on the Princeton model. Uh, and uh, it's, it's an excellent institute. I know it very well. I served as chairman of the advisory board for five years. So this is really what I think we're about, seeking new ways to meet the knowledge challenge. I always worry about this word, the knowledge. You know, what is knowledge? cutting edge research and conversation. And I think I just want to stress some of these things. Conversation through deep thinking, clear and uncompromising com conversations. Common understandings across all disciplines. 
And one of the great things that we have, and it's a word which Susie Stiles, uh, who's here, and at which I must say thank you very much. She gave us a word, um, and we call this slow scholarship. And it's, it's what we're trying to do. It's, trying, it's, it's not to take on the industrial scholarship that's going on elsewhere. It's not to return us to what we were in the old days, which is lazy scholarship. But it's accepting, I think, the fact that scholarship is a long process. And it takes a long time to think things through. It spends a lot of time reading and doing that kind of thing. And uh, this new book is out called The Slow Professor, which essentially reinforces these ideas. I don't think I was saying to Susie earlier that these are two professors of English. I don't think they thought very quickly about calling the book The Slow Professor, because I'm sure that some managers would like to take on the idea of The Slow Professor. But that's what we emphasized the fact that we're in slow scholarship. And uh, it's not the place to come and do a, a, a quick piece of work. So this is what we did. And I think this partly the, our success inside Gias has been the purchase of a really crazy higgledy-piggledy just this side of Kitch okay, building inside the northern suburbs of Johannesburg. It's in the leafy area called West Dean, between West Dean and Melville. It's perfectly safe, which people are always worried about. Johannesburg has a, has a rather rough reputation. But what it has, it has 12 or th uh, 11 suites. So you come there when you're in residence, and you live there on the, on the campus. And we feed you and, and certainly give you breakfast and give you lunch every day. And we give you some money to buy dinner from across the road. And so you all sit there. And one of the things we're trying to do is to develop community of scholars working across different fields. Uh, and I'm going to come to that in a minute and talk to you about some of this. Uh, this is the infamous Roman baths, which you've already seen. So what we try to do every year, and this is the 2016 program, um, and as I keep on saying to people, Gias is an experiment. We don't know where it's going to go. We don't know what we're going to do every year. So let me tell you what we did last year. The beginning of last year, we had a three-month writing semester in which we put together novelists academic writers, scientists, social scientists, and people in the humanities to live inside Gias for three months. Uh, and of course, we didn't imprison them there. We took them out for various outings, and, but they could come and go as they like. Um, and it was a fantastic experience. And I'm going to talk about some of the experience in a minute. But what we also did, and we've done this a number of times, is that we're taking people who in this rarefied atmosphere and dropping them in community. So what we did during this writing session is put some of the novelists in a bus and took them on a three-hour journey to a city where I grew up in, into schools. And we put the novelists in front of these kids. And people have heard me tell the story before. One of the novelists was a guy called Fred Kumalo, who's a rather senior novelist, and he walked into the school. There were 200 kids in this hall. And he took out the books, and he put the books in front of them, and he said, I wrote these books. These kids treated him like a rock star. How can you do this? This is fantastic. Can I have a book? You know, Just bringing to community, bringing to community, bringing, trying to bridge this gap in this way. And we also did it in the brain session, which I'll tell you about in a minute. And I just want to pause there to say one thing. One of, the thing. one of the issues we discussed in March was that we will use Gias over the weekends for maths and literacy training. So kids will come. We'll get kids in the local schools to come into Gias. Uh, Bertel Anderson very generously gave us an amount of money to start this project. And we will continue, continue to do this because it's completely wrong, we think, to have this pool of privilege in this huge uh, 
massive underdevelopment. So to go he gave his personal money, it wasn't NTU money. Yeah, 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 okay, all right. I didn't want to say that he gave his personal money, not NTU money. So, it was very difficult to organize it, but we were very grateful to him for doing this. So what I want to do here is go and just read this. I found the interdisciplinary unexpected conversations spontaneously emerge from the cross-section creative writers, academics who were fellows extremely enriching. I believe it would be an excellent for the Institute to encourage its eclectic mix of writers' energies rather than focus only or mainly on conventional scholarly work. So this is, I mean, this is testimony to people who are at the writing session. Here is another one, which is um, quite extraordinary. I worked on a manuscript of 90,000 words, uh, and I finished the second draft. Many aspects of the fellowship combined a conducive environment to qualify my work. Fellowship is situated, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Possibility of seclusion and access to colleagues is a great quality of fellowship, and lunchtime meetings were essential for that. And this is a novelist who's uh, quite an important figure uh, who, who wrote this uh, stuff. So it is a writing fellowship. It is a writing opportunity. And what we have this, this uh, term, uh, this year what we did is uh, we had a four-month break, a uh, four-month writing fellowship. I think it's too long. As I said, Jaius is an experiment. We, I now think it's too long, must be shorter. Um, and it's difficult to manage, and maybe in the, in the session we can talk about people getting leave to come uh, from, from, from NTU. But at least two people uh, are on the writing fellowship from NTU this year, and another person is coming in and out from the writing fellowship. So here's an opportunity uh, that can be easily picked up in. So in the second semester, uh, and as I say, I said to someone the other day, these aren't semesters, these are kind of seasons. What we do in, this, in the mixed session is we do a whole lot of workshops, uh, workshops, uh, seminars, opportunities for people to get together and speak from different institutions. Um, and so this is what we did in 2005. Uh, together with colleagues in a dedicated academic chair, we did something on, uh, on international law. So this was a project on international law. Then with uh, a group of people who come from Melbourne called uh, Thesis 11, which is, a, which is a, quite a famous journal, we had a seminar on social activism in the city of Johannesburg. And we did this with our colleagues here at the other university in Johannesburg, Witwatersrand, uh, uh, did a series of seminars which lasted about a week. I just want to pause here and say something. It's not that our work doesn't appear in an academic form. What we're doing, we took all of, this, all of these papers and they're presently in print for, for, a, for, a, for a number of Thesis 11. So it's going to come out now. And this is the second one we've actually done is produce a journal out of, out, of, uh, out, of, out of getting people together. So this is 2005. Last year, we did an interesting project which with not only the sister university in Johannesburg, but um, this is a, a group at London, at uh, uh, King's College London. Is it King's? Yeah. It's one of the London colleges with another sister university in another city and ourselves, we did a science and diplomacy workshop. I mean, this is amazing stuff. Essentially, what we're doing here is science and diplomacy, but uh, these people were talking about uh, scientific issues and how they resolved in diplomatic ways. And I talked to someone yesterday in HSS who's interested in doing work on universities and recognition of qualifications across the world. I think it's a really interesting project, and certainly we'll take that project further because I think this is also science, diplomacy, and uh, these difficult questions of governance. So this was a conference we did, revisiting the history of capitalism. We did it with uh, a Center for Indian Studies at WITS and a few other people, and it was really 
an extraordinarily strong conference. Uh, and we were happy to work with our colleagues at WITS. My view of this project, and I've, I'm making the point more and more, is that it can only be successful if we're open to other universities. So we're talking a lot to WITS, we're talking a lot to Pretoria, I'm working a little bit with the university or the Free State as an opportunity to open up. This thing must be representative of Johannesburg, the city. And it's not gonna happen immediately, it's gonna take a long time for it to happen. Um, and these are two conferences we did last year, two I'll just mention. This is one which Peter may be interested in, teaching social science in an age of apps. Uh, this guy is a rather big guy in my field, international re relations. He's a critical scholar, and one day he sent me an email and said, I'm working on an app. I said, you must be crazy. How can you put international politics in an app? Of course, he'd done it, and he took the sanctions as a global issue and put it all in an app. And uh, we had this really interesting conversation on the power of apps. And here was a, something we did. There's a lot of student activism in South Africa. And we looked at the 60 student activism in the US, its legacies and lessons for South Africa. And there was quite a lively group uh, involved in that process. So I think this gives um, the idea that this is Catholic. Uh, the, our interests are Catholic. And what we are trying to do is do interesting and innovative things, not simply run of the mill things, trying to work at this critical end of scholarship, trying to push the envelope a little bit. Um, and then towards the end of last year, and there are many alumni of this group here in this room, we had uh, a session on why the brain matters, which is a colloquium. We'll try to do these every year. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about it. It lasted 11 weeks, and at the end of it, we were absolutely exhausted. So it's clear to us that you can't do 11 weeks of colloquium, you'll die. Uh, and if we haven't got our act together for this year, it's, some of us are still suffering from, from this. Uh, but it was a interesting, and I hope people around the table would say successful operation. So why the brain matters? Why did we choose it? Well, these are two cartoons that I really love. Uh, if you can't read it, this says, good news, Mr. Burgess, we finally removed the tune that was stuck in your head. And here are all the notes of the tune in the bottle. And this one, this is Bob, he's the brains behind the company. But what we did was that I have a friend called Willem Hendrik Hispen, who is a professor of neuroscience and a very well-connected person. So we kind of got him as the point person and said, let's draw on all of your links and put together this project. And what we did was, um, oh, this one has gone one too far. Oh, this, what we did is, I'm gonna go back to the other one uh, in a second. We divided the work into brain studies. What is brain studies? What are we trying to do with brain studies? How far have we come? History of brain studies. Something on the cognitive brain. I think there were some people here who were in the cognitive brain session. Something on the creative brain and something on the social brain. And certainly two people in this room were at uh, this session here, uh, guilty as charged. Which one were you at? Cognitive brain. Cognitive brain, okay. So we divided the work and what, we layered participation, which was also a mistake. We got high flyers to come in and give papers. Then we had mid-ranking people and students, their postdoc students, of which you were one, Lydia was one. And... Uh, try to encourage them to use the three weeks in a creative fashion. The community building aspect was really interesting. It had a negative side, but it did have a positive side. For example, the students put together a little journal group, and they were working continuously on trying to write pieces for journals. And some of the senior people were helping them in this process. So a kind of mentorship was developing through this, uh, through this process. I want to go back if I can, because this is uh, a wonderful example of uh, NTU and UJ in partnership. The opening lecture, which was a public lecture, was given by Balas Gulash, of course, who's a professor here, extremely well known. It was a public event. And I think this showed the best example 
of the partnership in action, the partnership between UJ and NTU in action. And I think these are, these are the kind of things we've got to explore, how we can bring big names from both institutions into conversations here. So I'm going to jump that. This is uh, the Cognitive Brain Group here. Is this the Cognitive Brain Group? Oh, I'm sorry about this. Uh, here's the Cognitive Brain Group. Uh, what we had was uh, 32 people came and participated in the conference, and then we had South Africans too. So in, in total, about 80 people were involved in the project. Uh, and the people came from 16 different countries to participate. Uh, it, it, was, it was a relatively cheap exercise. If I told you what the whole thing cost, it was relatively cheap. Um, but I think in terms of influencing people's lives and the direction of their thinking, uh, I think it was an extraordinarily important, uh, uh, but as I say, the rest of it are exhausted uh, as a result of this. What we did do as, as we did this project is also find a way of reaching out and pulling people in who are interested in brain questions. So here is uh, a trip we did to one of the best schools in Johannesburg um, and got one of our speakers, his name appears here in a very small way, which must have hurt him a little bit, um, one of our speakers to go and talk to a school about brain studies. And I wasn't actually at this meeting, but I'm told in the end there were 400 people there, less school kids and, and more parents <laughs> who came to this project. Now this is one way we can do is also take the project into a school and try and link to the city. How many kids were there? I don't think. All the seats were full and it was not only the with the parents, yeah. the grandparents. Was <laughs> the grandparents, I uh, can understand. Um, so this was, this was one of the projects we did here with the brain session, is take Jaius's work during these sessions outside. This was an extraordinary event. Uh, a South African actress, Irene Stefanu, has multiple sclerosis. And what we did, she came to us. She said, I hear you having this event on the brain. And she said, I am trying to do a piece of theater on my condition. She said, we will come and do a piece of theater for you and your participants inside the brain session. And they came to, and she came and did it. It was extraordinary, you know, moving. And then the academics and people who are brain specialists asking these deep questions, you know, can you feel this? Do you feel this? Do you this? Do you this? So kind of real sort of, is this ethical to have done this? <laughs> so she made me feel right. I mean, I just think it's interesting yeah. to kind of have this kind of. Well, I mean, she volunteered and we Yeah, okay. She wasn't completely, um, all right. Like, as someone who named herself okay. the subject. All right, great. I think it's, it's safe. <laughs> Susie told me she'd done a book on ethics in research, so I was a bit worried about we'd done something wrong. But uh, it was an extraordinary event, this, uh, because it was really moving, I think, uh, interesting. And then what we also did when we did uh, one of the sessions with the brain is put the participants in a bus and drive them to a rural area where there's a dance studio and got them to talk to people who dance for a living about what's happening to them when they're dancing in their brains. So I guess I'm saying to you that we try to be as creative as we can in our approach to these things and sort of break new ground. So here's the report of the brain session. If you're at the brain session, get it off the website. Uh, it, it is uh, an interesting document. It's written to make it accessible. And hopefully it will go on and papers will be produced around it. Uh, people will try and find ways to use this information in a different way uh, and uh, to what has happened so far. 
So this is more or less the way we're thinking at the moment. We're doing a writing term, some mixed seminars here. Sorry, spelling mistake. And we're thinking about doing a colloquium called Language Matters. And in a second, I'll talk about how far that conversation is uh, with the language issue. We may not do it this year, we'll do it next year, uh, because this year is already on, on the run. And just on colloquia, the one that we will do after this, and I think we are, it's kind of almost as advanced as the language thing, is we'll do something on money, different perspectives of money sociology of money, the technology of money, the politics of money, belief in money, all of these kind of things. Uh, and I'm hoping, uh, depending on what happens in South Africa, that we'll do it with the Reserve Bank, South Africa's Reserve Bank, who have already indicated a, a interest in it. So here are the seminars, and I've just signaled them here to tell you the areas that uh, the, this is what we're doing in this term. Prelude to decolonization, the debate on decolonizations, which is kind of history of thought. Here's one, Peter, that might interest you, radical thinking on schooling. Uh, one of the big problems in South African schooling is in certain areas is that kids are just not focused on the schooling. This is a problem that I don't even think you can imagine in Singapore. But what happened, here's the background. Uh, some guy spends, uh, he's a retired headmaster, spends a lot of his time working amongst poor schools in a part of South Africa that's really rough, the Cape Flats. Another guy I know wrote a book on criminal gangs. Okay, these two things are miles apart. But the guy who's the headmaster said to me, if we want to solve our problem in the schools, We've got to read this book on criminal gangs. Because what the gangs have done is managed to capture the kids. The gangs have given them an identity. The gangs have given them a sense of purpose in life. The gangs have given them a sense of belonging, who they are. So what we're trying to do is do three sessions, maybe this year into next year, on uh, radical thinking on South African schooling. Are there radical solutions to these problems? What are these solutions? Can they be? So that's uh, a thing that's going to engage. Opioids and harm is in medical anthropology. We're doing something on expulsions from South African states, and we're doing something with the law folk, or trying to do something with the law folk on living in a post-human rights world. So this gives us an idea of the, of the different projects that we're thinking about. And if we come to the colloquium on language, this is almost as far as we've gotten with this thinking. Firstly, a kind of philosophical week about what is language drawing the brain stuff closer to this. Then something about language in Africa. Africa is much more, in our, certainly in our minds, clear and, uh, and, uh, and focused. Uh, Africa has an enormous amount of languages. Uh, they play all kinds of roles, but we wondered if we should do some sort of comparison stuff with Asia. And then multilingualism in South Africa, Singapore, Nigeria, and the Netherlands. Uh, and uh, Dr. Susie Stiles and I have to have a conversation about this. And then language and ambiguity, language and its death. And we know that there are people at the NUS who are working on the death of languages. Uh, we also want to talk about Yiddish and other languages. We also want to talk about comparative morphologies and these problems. So this is the kind of thing that we, we will do in the next colloquium. This is the last sort of formal slide, and I think this is interesting because it gives us an opportunity to think about Jaius outside of the present project. One is we have space to have postdocs together at Gias, and one of the long-term projects, certainly won't be in my directorship, is an effort to put Singapore postdocs together with UJ postdocs in a place and get them just to free will. And let's see what happens in these kind of conversations. Uh, uh, the next is a laddering process to try and get postdocs to 
uh, interact with Nobel Prize winners, and this is something we have to begin to work more on, is trying to get um, more people involved from the kind of higher end of advanced study, and it's, uh, it's, it's a project that uh, needs some um, yeah, uh, thinking about. One of the incubator things we've done, and there are two bits to this, one is policy outreach to get policy people into the room. When we had the science and diplomacy thing, we had people from the Department of Science and Technology who deal with international affairs there. And they came away with a lot of interesting ideas, I think, and we learned a lot from them. But one of the other incubators, and this is uh, people who are at the brain session, this is the first you will have heard about it. When we launched this book two weeks ago in Johannesburg, Witts University, which is the other university in South Africa, in Johannesburg, and who we are trying to outreach to, came to us and said, we will give a devoted PhD scholarship to the continuation of this work. So it, said, it suggests to us that we're doing something right here, that this other university would come to us. And more and more, I'm going to try and interact with the Witts people. It's politically, it's quite difficult, but it's made easier by the fact that their president and I are old friends. And then the other thing we do here is we continuously will look for ways to break new ground. And it's really here that we need to have deep interaction with NTU people. This is as much your institute as it is our institute. And it can only succeed if we get input from both sides. This is... Uh, uh, just a, a small governance thing to tip, my, uh, to tip uh, one's hat to this part of things. A director, senior academic from either university can uh, take the job. An oversight board meet once a year, three members from each uh, university and a director, and a board of trustees is being appointed. So a few points. What are the distinguishing features? It's an intimate setting. It's focused on slow scholarship. It's city-based. It's multidisciplinary. And one of the big things is that it's flexible. So we can change our mind or push people in to seminars in a very quick way because we don't have huge uh, over overcapitalized in terms of staffing and things like that. Uh, in the last year, there was a lot of st uh, student unrest in Johannesburg, and three times people phoned us and said, can we have a seminar inside Gias? And I said, sure, of course. So we're flexible. And I think that flexibility allows us to tackle things in a, in a, in a really creative ways. I want to thank you, and I want to repeat what I said at the beginning. I want to thank uh, Christian and uh, uh, Adeline and... Uh, and um, Sharan for all the work they've done. And I'm looking forward to us uh, having a conversation about your ideas of what we could do or your ideas of how to, come, how to come to us and your ideas of helping to grow this project. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if you need much introduction. So Zachary is with us as an assistant professor in NIE. Mm -hmm. and went over to participate in the Brain, Why the Brain Matters colloquium in the end of 2016, mm -hmm. and has kindly taken up our request to share a little bit of his experience with us at Giants. Over to you. Uh, thanks. I, I'm, like I said, um, I'm going to make this quick, not because not because I have to go, but I do. But it's more that it, um, I think this is a great time to ask, ask questions. But I just want to tell you a little bit about my experience. Uh, I had signed up for, wanted to go, the, the program that I was interested in was the creative brain. I work with, um, uh, in education with students with disabilities. And so I'm, one of the areas I'm really interested in is neuroscience and how the brain works, especially for students who learn very differently. Um, they don't learn in traditional ways. So what happens in their brains? And uh, I had the opportunity to go, uh, the program was three weeks long, but I only went for two weeks because of commitments that I had here with classes and, and research and such. Um, but I gotta say, it was, a, it, was a, it was a fantastic experience. The way that it worked for the week, that, or the two weeks that I was there is we would meet in the morning, um, a group of scholars from around the world. And that was another thing that I liked. I know that 
up here we talk a lot about the, you know, the Asian Africa mix, but we had um, people from Holland and Israel and Nepal, um, Uganda, South Africa, Asia. We had probably of the, I would say the 13 to 14 of our scholars, I think there were nine countries represented. Um, and so you had people from all over the world that you know, could talk about the research in their areas, what they were doing, et cetera. And I personally found that really, really, really um, cultivating, so to speak. And I think the big thing for me was, as, as Peter has mentioned, the whole idea of slow scholarship. Because again, we would meet in the mornings you know, for two to three hours and talk about a, a theme. And then the rest of the day, I could catch up on work or just think about what we had talked about. I could write in this beautiful, uh, I don't know how to explain it. I call it a castle. Like it's just, it's just this amazing like little place in the middle of a, you know, it's a beautiful, beautiful location. So, um, you know, I had my own room in the castle and I would go up and I had a room with a view and I would look out and I would, you know, it was, it was like what you imagine academia is going to be, you know? <laughs> and then, then no, seriously, you know, when, I, when you go into academia, you think you're going to like write and have this scenic view and there's going to be a lake and birds and it's going to be beautiful. And then, you know, you, you get administrative paperwork and you have emails to answer, you know, you have all these other things. Um, so for me, it was fantastic because I had this time in the morning where I could focus on a topic and have these great discussions. And, and one of the things that I don't think they talk about enough is, I mean, they make breakfast for you, they make lunch for you. So it's like it's all right there. You, you know, you don't have to go do those things. Um, so I'd wake up, I'd have breakfast, and uh, I, I went out for runs in a couple mornings, you know, and just got a workout in, and then we'd have these great two to three hour sessions. And then I would come back and, and, and just think and work and talk with my colleagues. And, um, so it was really, really, really just a nice I, way to slow down, so to speak, you know. Um, so for me, that was, that was what was uh, the fantastic about it. Along with, obviously, like I said, the, the different perspectives that we had from around the world. And then I think the final thing that I really want to emphasize, because he's already mentioned how safe it is and, and um, you know, the, the, I don't remember the word you used, but the, the, the beautiful little place you stay, it's just amazing. The thing that I was so um, appreciative of was the fact that the staff there, I mean, really, uh, anything you needed, they were there to help you, but also they organized all these amazing little side trips. So we, you know, we did an art tour in Johannesburg one day, and we just looked at street art. And, and then, of course, we took it with artists. So we're talking about what's happening in the brain, and the other neuroscientists are asking questions. You know, so it was like it wasn't just sitting in a classroom around a table um, thinking and, and talking there. You were going out into the community. I was part of the group that went out three hours away and, and talked to the dance troupe, you know, um, and we did that. And then I was also there for her. Um, performance, you know, the actress. And so you had all these other things that you could go. We went on a safari, you know, during one of the weekends in between. So we had all these other things that they arranged for you, which I, I thought were, were really um, great growth opportunities as well. So I just, I had a fantastic experience. I, I highly recommend it to anyone um, just because if nothing else, you get a chance to just step away and think. And I think that um, in academia, that's what we should be doing, but we all get caught up in and all the other things, you know. Uh, I've got three grants right now and just figuring out how to, to do the paperwork. You know, forget the research, right? Just to do the paperwork itself takes up so much time. And so, um, you know, I think the opportunity to just go have really great conversations from people from around the world, think about these things, write about what you want to write about in a beautiful setting, as well as have all these other opportunities to go out and have dinner in and, and places that are unique and fascinating and fun. For me, that was, it was a brilliant, brilliant experience. And so um, I'm happy to, to take emails, or I know that you've got maybe some other questions, but um, you know how to get a hold of me if anybody wants to email me. But I'm always willing to talk about it and, um, and promote it, because I, I was just a brilliant experience, uh, not just personally, but, but especially professionally. I thought it was a real good time of a couple of weeks of really solid growth for me. So it was really nice. So, thank you. thank you. We had this fascinating mix of participants who had um, entire research careers in the way that uh, interactions between small mammals might change the way that small mammals respond to stress. And at one end of the spectrum, and then people who were looking at the neurophysiobiology 
of um, stress responses in people who contracted AIDS uh, earlier in their life. And so it was this hugely interesting and complex mix of people with different perspectives all brought together, just thinking about brains and people and interactions. Uh, and my contribution was from uh, uh, psycholinguistics and the way that learning to speak a different language might subtly shape the way that you interact with your world and with other people as well. Um, and what was pretty unique about this situation was, I, we've, we've all said it, but the time allowed to think about these ideas in, in such a collegiate environment. Uh, the space helps, it's beautiful, uh, it's very reminiscent of um, some of those historic universities I studied. I was fortunate enough to take my PhD at Oxford University where buildings that are ancient and beautiful are an inspiration to everyone. But this is a more accessible, beautiful, inspirational academic environment uh, and we should all take as much advantage of it as we can. It's magnificent. So that's all I've really got to contribute but I'm happy to take questions and, and uh, be involved in the chat. Thank you. So. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, I thought because I'm, I'm quite inspired by all this. Uh, I'm, I'm surprised that I didn't know about it earlier. Somehow I must have been sequestered. <laughs> um, I, I've got a, a few sort of questions about it. I think, I think it's what I love about what you described is precisely that kind of openness. Um, and my first question was about how the themes that you eventually have that turn into say conferences, how they emerge. Do they do they actually emerge from those those writing sessions, for example, and use that possibility? Of it? Because I've seen that happen before where people get together, they spend a bit of time together and gradually things begin to bubble up out of that and, and you can create some kind of thing. That's one thing. But do you have any any sort of overview of the direction that you want to go in with with things? I mean, one of the things that I that I know from um, from Brendan uh, is that there's a there's a, a move towards um, looking at what it means to create a curriculum that is decolonialized. And this is why I'm so excited about going there in July because that's you know, that kind of really impresses me as well. And um, um, but what I this, this is leading on to a more difficult question I think, um, and that is. Singapore and South Africa are very different places. Scholarship is a very different thing in Singapore from South Africa, from what I can see. I don't want to go too far into that at the moment, but you can probably guess what some of that means. Um, and I wonder if... What am, I, what, am I think, what am I thinking is, is scholarship itself something that you that requires investigating here. Not not just topics in a sense, but scholarship itself is complete. What is what is scholarship? What one of the things that I think there's something very interesting about South Africa because of its political emergence. Because of what's what well I've I've only been there once, but I was just bowled over by it because of the sense of engagement, excitement. Um, that I felt constantly over, and, and coming from Singapore, I felt enormous freedom in South Africa to, to talk about things with people. You know, in, in a, you, you, there's a, there's a self-censorship that happens here in Singapore, without doubt. Um, and uh, I won't go too far down that road, but what, I, but what I think is that that's an interesting question, what scholarship is, and with your your comments about language, what scholarship is in a world that's dominated by English. Um, because I think that, for us here, is a really serious question that we avoid, basically. Look, all of these questions are uh, central, I think, to the project itself. Uh, the first, uh, the answer to the first one is guilty as charged. Mostly, this has been me drawing off my own memories. 
who do I know, who is talking to people, is this an interesting idea, yes it is, who else do I know who's working on this, who's interesting. Uh, so maybe you're drawing off from a lifetime of academic networks to kind of get the thing going. Uh, and, uh, but some of these ideas for these new seminars are people coming to us and saying to us, you know, this will be an interesting thing. Uh, intellectual life in Johannesburg is quite vigorous, mm -hmm. uh, and there are established institutes, uh, and we have had conversations in joining with them. I mean, one of the big institutes in Johannesburg is a place called Wiser, and it's the Institute for Social and Economic Research, which has this huge reputation. And uh, we had a, a conversation earlier in the year, and I said to the director, let's have a really big conference on the, pro the idea of progress. Mm -hmm. Because it is such an interesting, such a burning question, uh, given all the constraints that we see on us. So we do sort of interact with people, and ideas come up in, in sort of uh, up from the ground, as you describe it. So yes, a uh, lot. Some of these ideas come from community groupings, people sitting down, talking over lunch, coming to me and saying, "This is an idea," etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I'm sorry to make this so personal, but one of the things I think I'm blessed with is that I don't have an oversight committee who's looking over my shoulder and micromanaging me. It's very nice. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> and I, don't, I don't have this committee micromanaging me all the time, saying to me, you know, this, 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 this is what you should do. And I think that's an advantage, because I see other people running institutes who do have these committees that they refer to. So they're pushed in a certain a, a sort of a resource-oriented question that I think is related. Sure. Well, it may emerge how it's related. How, how many rooms have you got for residential? Well, how many rooms have you got for meeting that are not residential? Uh, maybe three. Okay. How often are they empty? A lot. Right. Because um, there might be an opportunity to allow open application for like team away days where like a lab group or yeah. a, a, a um, research team yeah, could say we want to come for four days right. and during those four days we we found three teams in South Africa who we want, just want to meet with during that time right. Right. and there's only three of us right. can we have three rooms for four days um, and like an academic BNB, not quite, but maybe you have terms where you say like, we've got this many rooms available for this many days, like five day slots. Open application, anyone can apply, maybe not with the same funding structure. But out of what comes of those meetings, that there may be themes that you don't know about that are so well supported or, or point the direction for some of the one, two, three year future yeah. planning. Yeah. Because that way you could like make the most of the resources, make it more accessible to a wider, because I can imagine most folks at NTU have never thought about whether there is a person in South Africa that they could collaborate with. But if they know that they can apply for um, an opportunity, so they might Google. Yeah, yeah, see, money. Money. <laughs> <laughs> right, 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 right. So, so such a great idea. something just to like spark connections, mm -hmm. um, or uh, there are a few possible ways of potentially putting things like this together. But um, scientific speed dating is becoming a, a thing where you get like uh, when you were mentioning your postdocs. Uh, if you have social events where everyone spends two to three minutes discussing as quickly as possible their area of interest to every other person in the room, and then you all have a buffet dinner, people are talking to each other in much more detail after they've had this like intellectual speed dating, um, intense uh, contact. But the collaborations that come out of that are the ones where there were so many people in the room, everyone's going to find someone to talk to who they're really excited about pursuing ideas with in the future. 
um, or a pre-registration party uh, where groups of people get together and the goal of the session, even though it seems like a quick trick, right? I know speed dating doesn't quite fit the slow scholarship thing, but that's only the start, right? But a pre-registration event where a group of people sit in a room together and challenge themselves to pre-register a, a, a research idea that they will work on from that point onwards. Fantastic. So the, these kinds of things that can be used to sort of spark, um, if we're here now and we get this far, what are we going to do with it next? Yeah. Like to, yeah. That speed dating thing works. Yeah, I've, it does. I've, I've done it. Done it's it. magnificent, yeah. right? It works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, you, and you get unexpected research projects coming out. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, like, like, the speed dating thing, I've never heard of that, but I, I can see it and I can see how it works. So, what are these ideas we're looking for? Yeah. I mean, yeah one yeah. of the things I said to uh, this guy who does our website is why don't we have a portal on our website where you just make suggestions? You know, drop in, I would like to do something. I think Josh should do something on what, what is scholarship. Mm. You know, just drop it into the website and write a small paragraph, 100 words, and let's talk about it. Uh, fortunately, and uh, the President will change, and uh, the Vice Chancellor will change at UJ, but since we've locked them into this five-year contract, fortunately now, it seems I don't have to worry, or the Director doesn't have to worry about my because we do have the money. And into you have this commitment. So you know, we want to reach this stage of the trap that everybody's in. Get money, money is tied to certain specific outcomes. So in a sense, this is free money. Yeah. And that, that I think makes a big difference. Yeah. Uh, because as soon as we know this, as soon as you get into contract work, or uh, what is the other word that's going on? Uh, work in which you're obliged to run in a certain way. It's a good by scholarship. I, I agree. I'd like to I mean, this is the thing that I'm so, like, you know, I really like about this that is the minute you start tying it to particular outcomes, right. you, you begin to narrow the research. Yeah. Unfortunately, that happens all too often. I, I was involved back in the 1980s in the Humanities Research Centre in ANU. Um, and one of the things that I loved about that was that we were just free to, to you know, follow what we wanted to do. Um, that very often turned into um, actual teaching courses as well. But, you know, I, I look back on that period now as a kind of golden age that seems to have gone, but there's one kind of spy on this. No, I mean, I, I do think that there are areas of scholarship that we have to look at. One is this. Uh, and, and it can reopen, recreate that space. One is this recognition of qualifications, which I think is really important. Yeah. The other is this question that no one wants to talk about. What is the future of academic publishing? I mean, this, to me, is the biggest thing we face. Because we know that publishing companies are a Ponzi scheme. Okay. We know that technology is chomping at our, at our heels. We know that this whole industry has been infested with bandits. Okay. <laughs> I mean, you just switch on your computer and five bandits are there setting you a conference or a journal or something else. And just if you'll just, uh, just stick with me for a second. And the other day, someone sent me something and said, Be, this is a librarian at the university, beware of these journals. I said, this is the whole question. Okay, it's not be wearing the journals. Let's look at the system that's creating that. It's allowing these people into the, into the structure. So I think that there are areas that we can investigate very deeply in this comes to your third point. We can investigate very deeply. But the, the comparative thinking of it. Actually, uh, I, I think that there is a genuine um, uh, and difficult to resolve challenge to the notion of academic expertise. Oh, I, I think I think that's partly at the bottom of it. Oh, do you mean the post-truth? Do you mean the post-truth? No, 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 no,
I mean that I think that um, uh, because we're now in, a, in an era where there, genu there is genuine distributed expertise in the, in the, in the internet, the, the notion of um, uh, or the valuing of, of um, kind of focused individual expertise um, is is dif it's different. The notion of academic expertise is different from what it was 30 years ago. And uh, I, I don't mean it as a as a debased thing necessarily. Yeah. I, I mean, but I mean it's on the challenge. You mean the death of the genius, as in the isolated, unique individual who is the only one who knows anything about yeah. anything. Right. And, it, and, and academic identity is something challenging. Yeah. I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. I, but I, I, all I'm saying is I think it's a subject that, yeah. I, so, so what else can we do with the other colleagues that are here? What else can we do to uh, to work together? Oh, well, I'm kind of out of my experience here because from the Radharathan School of International Studies and a master's student uh, pursuing strategic studies, all about it, guns and bombs and so on and so forth, destruction essentially, uh, with a little bit of creation put it here and there. Um, but when I received this email, it seemed, uh, I mean, it was, it was extremely interesting because what I came here to get a sense of what was the, uh, the think tank space and the scholarship space in, in, in Johannesburg. And uh, I, it exceeded my expectations to see the sort of, you know, the kind of candor with which you are approaching this entire exercise, being very honest about the mistakes and like the fact that it's, it's, it is an experiment. So, uh, just, I mean, to put it out there, uh, would you, do you see space for, say, any, anything defense-related, security-related, very hard security-related stuff in uh, what you're trying to do here? So, let me, so let me pick up two things. I mean, one is people have tried to call us a think tank, and I've just resisted this because I'm with Hannah Hart. The problem with think tank is that they don't think uh, because a certain language, a certain routine, there's a certain way of doing this thing. And it's, it's, it's just a complete distortion. So with all respect to RSIS, I mean, I think that there are good implementations of this. So, so we as students, um, I'm glad you mentioned this field. This is a field that I've been working on for most of my professional life. Uh, and I've been working in critical security studies for the last 30 years now, uh, and brought critical security studies to South Africa. saying goodbye to it, right. but um, this is so. So yes, I mean, uh, there's a, there are a lot of conversations we have to have about critical security studies, what, what this means so to come in security. So the answer is yes. Uh, you know, and it, it's not a business school. I mean, I had one of these uh, audit people come to see me a few years ago, and she said to me, first year she, she parked her BMW sports car in my place. And then she walked in and said to me, uh, okay, well, something like this, and she said, so you like a business school? And I'm, I'm a bit nervous because we're right next to the business school. And I said, well, don't like a business school. <laughs> and you know, I don't all like a business school. I mean, people in business schools can come and talk to us. You know, let's talk about society, business, inter interaction, and that kind of thing. It's a legitimate thing, but I think we should have this conversation. But I don't think we should be locked into these things. That's where I would like to sort of say, how do you incorporate the business community? Because I see frequently they don't necessarily think. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll pick the thinkers. <laughs> well, I'm glad you read that. I'm glad you said that and not me. Uh, look, one of the things is to try and get the business community interested in this project. This is where the fundraisers come to see me, you know, can we help you fundraisers? Yeah. It would be nice if the business community picked up some of these things. This is where my successor is going to have to go with this project. 
we don't want them to control what's going to happen. So give us a fellowship every year to bring a top American thinker to South Africa. I think it's a fellowship. You can call it the Standard Bank Fellowship or the Scholarship. But you want to abuse them. I want them to come there to learn. To no, no, I don't want to abuse them. I don't want to abuse them. I want to uh, find a way of interacting with them. By taking their money. <laughs> well, you call that abuse. I call it social, social advancement. I mean, one of the things that we have done, and it's, it gives us a sense of, I think, the playfulness of the place. Our main meeting room, we've called the cartoon room. And we have cartoons in this room and change the cartoons if the guy contracted does his job properly three times a year. So we have cartoons in this room and some of them stand in the bank and to see and say, don't you want to subsidize these cartoons three times a year? You know, the cartoons are telling us amazing things about what's happening in this world. The political cartoons, I should yeah. add. <laughs> like, well, in the sort of thing you would see in a, like a newspaper or a yeah. New Yorker or something that's like commentary on some topical yeah. recent issue. I also wanted to add, just going back to the point about you know, what was happening in Dias and who's doing it. Uh, basically, it's a skeleton staff that manages the, the physical space, but there's no full time faculty yeah. researchers associated with. Institute, it's bringing people in and creating collaborations and interactions. So, if there were some, like some of the ideas we've been talking about of, of different themes, there's nothing stopping us thinking about doing something around uh, security, defence studies, uh, getting people together from Singapore, NTU, getting people from Johannesburg and other places and doing it there over a week or something like that. But uh, yeah, when it comes to the staff, it's basically director, support staff. That's it. Yeah. So the framework is there, and then how we create that content is, is really up to us. Yeah. It's up to NTU and UJ as the main drivers. Drivers. But we can always bring in other people if and when we, we need to and we want to. It's like a caravan of ideas which remains still. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the problem is that if we don't use this space, suddenly a little is going to close it. I mean, let's be clear about it. Yeah. So if we don't use the spaces. And on the NTU side, we do have some uh, funding to support the activities at GIAS, and so far we've used it for supporting our faculty, staff, and students to go and uh, participate in different activities over there. So it's not like we're asking the community to come up with ideas and then you're on your own. There is some you know, funding and resources there to support um, NTU particularly NTU, but also other people to be involved. It's not, a, it's not an unlimited pot of money, but it's it's sufficient for what we need to, to do. And when things become successful, I can go back and ask for more money, or continue being successful, and I can go back and ask for more money as well. But we need to see that, you know, that there's things coming out of it, of course. But the other thing we've only been in this since 2015, we've got one year, Slightly fellow, I think, but you know, the energy will pick up. Right? <coughs> but only you know, with people like Peter coming to us now, getting a sense of having a conversation with Eugene, or thinking, saying to Brendan, this is a great other space here, let's use it. You know, it's as much of a problem to sell giants inside UJ as it is to sell giants inside. Like in USA, but I, I know that there are plenty of like 
students in the humanities and social sciences who are interested, but they just can't find a practical purpose to say that I want to go here. But that, that uh, passion and interest is actually what drives a lot of us to want to study in the first place. So like, for example, I, I was in a music institute and then one of my uh, fellow interns, he started a CCA called Engaging Africa. So I, I think he would have been really interested, but then it's only open to a few stuff. But uh, I, I'm also interested in like cultural change and diaspora. So it's got to do also with my lineage. Because my mother's side, she's Yemeni. And then the, the Hajami diaspora, they apparently went to Africa, India, and Southeast Asia. So I, should, I, I think that uh, when people study these perspectives, they come up with a very different picture from what's not being mainstream media. So if there is something for that, then I think it could work uh, provided we get enough people who are interested. Well, people movement is a, is a huge very issue at, at the moment in this region as well as in Africa. In Africa. And I, I know our humanities and, well, sorry, it's not humans. It has been the parting of the waters. Yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> sorry? It, it is no longer. No longer. There is uh, H, H and SSS. I, I, I don't know what H is anymore, but the School of Social Sciences. <laughs> Anyhow, look, we have lots of um, expertise in uh, labour movement and, and uh, people moving across borders and undocumented, like, undocumented migration and things in our social sciences school. So, like, if there were a, a, a strategic alliance between a group of people across schools who were interested in looking at people movement, for example, that's the perfect kind of thing to Absolutely. approach giants and say, Absolutely. hey, can we can we get our side over there to do this and find some people on, on your side who, you know, that sounds yeah, ideal. It sounds good. Uh, so I there are, it just, there are in, in South Africa, enormous, uh, many diasporas that we don't understand. There was a Zanzibar diaspora, Muslim diaspora, that stole out of Zanzibar and moved down the western coast of the country, uh, eastern coast of the country, right to Cape Town. And this has been almost unexplored. Uh, some stuff written about it, of course. But Peter raised, which is the hegemony of western knowledge, yeah. has excluded this stuff. Outside, but now with this power to decolonize knowledge and to raise new epistemologies and try to understand the world, these things are going to be drawn to the fore in many ways. And uh, also, like, to add to this, I think if we could get the Arab community here on board because Yemen and Ethiopia has got good relations, right? and then uh, because of the diaspora in India and Africa and Southeast Asia, uh, added to that, I have another project where I'm working on uh, Indian logic. Uh, the development of Indian logic and its uh, possible applications in Islam. Because right now, when people study the medieval, the, the, the development of medieval logic, they focus on the Greek as aspects. But I think there's a lot of promise in the Indian aspects. And how this is related to Africa is that apparently the Muslim community in Africa has a large Indian diaspora. Like the Muslim of Zimbabwe is a sort of celebrity in the Muslim community. It's, but his tradition of that it goes back to India. So, like we it's developing new applications of uh, Indian logic in Islam and uh, the studies of diaspora, like uh, Muslim diaspora, Arab Indian, uh, or any diaspora in Africa. I think that would be a promising project. It sounds a fantastic project. It sounds a fantastic project. There's a lot of work done uh, on Indian Ocean studies, and not from a military strategy, <laughs> but from this cultural point of view. Right, right across the ocean, and in uh, fact, one of the professors in your department uh, works on these things. It's amazing. It's a little bit of a sea tan. We've had a couple of conversations about the Indian Ocean Studies. Uh, I mean, this is something I think we should take into account. Even the Indian government, uh, they sort of have a soft counter to so-called Chinese, you know, hard, 
strategic angle of developing infrastructure ports and so on, you will use ports for probable naval usage in the future. So the, the, the counter is more of the work we call Project Mossum. Mossum is nothing but the uh, internalized version of Monsoon. So instead, you know, so we're looking at cross-cultural linkages throughout the uh, eastern seaboard of Africa, right from Tanzania and so on and so forth, and see how these, how the movements happened you know, since, uh, say, about the seventh century A.D. back before. And so on. Even lately, like there were a lot of uh, Gujarati Hindu traders who moved to decided the populations in Uganda. Well, if at any point anyone wants, like the world expert on pirates. I can, I can always give you a phone call. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and law of the sea. Law of the sea. Oh, yeah. It, it, which touches on people movement, human migration, but also strategic, <laughs> like are you building airstrips on islands yeah. that didn't exist six months ago? Yeah. I mean, part it's of the problem is that some of these conversations <laughs> is that they always take place in strategic studies institutes. So when people talk about Indian Ocean questions, they're always in strategic studies institutes, and there's a particular language which can't free and so on. Well, that's why I'm offering a lawyer. Oh, uh, no. Yes, you know, and, and if there <laughs> are, yeah. And, and I think this is what Jayas offers, is the opportunity for a topic to become very interdisciplinary. Yeah. <clears throat> One of the difficulties that that always seems to be um, uh, finding a suitable interdisciplinary language um, or, or, or some way of communicating. I mean, we all know um, that there's, a, there's, there's always a difficulty in students who do their final year projects or even their PhDs across disciplines. They're often very difficult, you know, there's a, because the, because the disciplinary languages can often be very strong. That's why that's why I think scholarship is is an interesting thing to address in something like this because inherently you're doing things in a cross disciplinary way, you're challenging certain ways of speaking about them. Absolutely. We can continue this. The food is ready, so we could even have the food and then continue.